connect with you actually, Michaela. Okay. Hi everyone, good afternoon. I hope you had a nice long weekend and were able to enjoy some of the lovely weather we had. For those of you who are newcomers, um, the Marie Keating team would like to extend a warm welcome to you. And for those of you who have had the opportunity to join in and tune in over the last four weeks, you're very welcome back. We're now more than halfway through our series, not with only, now with only one more week to go. So today's session is going to focus on managing stress and anxiety in the hospital setting. But before we go into that, we at the Marie Keating Foundation would like to acknowledge the work that has been done and continues to be done by our frontline workers in Ireland and around the world. Those who are caring for those who are ill and for each other through COVID and beyond. At the very core of healthcare working practice is the act of caring. No matter where you work in the hospital setting, be it public or private, caring is intertwined. Caring is a feeling and an exhibition of showing concern and empathy for others, showing or having compassion. So from nurses, porters, cleaners, doctors, consultants, healthcare assistants, technicians, scientists, administration staff, we salute you. Being a carer during COVID-19 is a job we could not have done without an essential worker, caring to survive and working to flourish. We will come out of COVID having completely rethought the importance of healthcare and indeed what the health service might even look like. Thank you for doing all you do to keep us safe. We know that messages of support and gratitude now more than ever can be very positively motivating. We're going to have a presentation from Professor Michaela Higgins in a few moments, and she's going to tell us how it is during this time with cancer and COVID in the hospital setting. Please use these learning experiences as an opportunity week on week to make some action plans for yourself, as I say, week on week, but try and use them beyond this six week sem seminar as well. So for the first four weeks, we have learned about healthy diet, exercise, the importance of sleeping well, and managing your mental health during this stressful time. Um, and so please do sit back and um, take away with you what is important for you today. Um, Michaela will be talking to us about managing stresses and anxieties when we are facing hospital appointments, scans, or even an admission. So my name is Helen Forrestal. I'm the Director of Nursing Services at the Marie Keating Foundation. And now we're going to go through some housekeeping rules again, as this is a webinar. So you're in your own homes, please make yourselves comfortable, make sure you can see us on your screen and also make sure that you can hear us. If you have a phone, maybe um, turn it off or silence it, whatever suits you. Um, Jennifer Cinnamon, our senior communications manager is in the background managing technology for the session. So thank you, Jennifer, for that. 
As an attendee, um, you cannot see, um, you can see us and hear us, but we cannot see you. Um, so you're, you come in um, off video. Very important, I think, for this seminar or webinar is, is the Q&A session. Um, it's a very important part of maybe something you might want to ask. Um, so please uh, participate where you can. Um, you will find the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Click into this and type your question and then press the enter or return key. That will ensure that the question comes to us here. Um, and then we will look at those um, and put them to Michaela towards the end of the session during discussion and Q&A. If you see a question that's been submitted and you, and you want to ask that question yourself, you might see the like icon, which is like the Facebook like icon. If you click on that, it will ensure that that question goes to the top of the queue and is very likely to be answered. You will also see a chat button and generally speaking, we don't use this during the question and answer session. So the Q&A button is particularly for the, the questions you, you would like to ask. The webinars to, to date have been recorded and they're available on our website, um, Cancer and COVID Information, rekeating.ie, um, if you wish to view those later and it will be available um, in, in the coming days. It is also nice, I think, um, for us to, I suppose, know uh, virtually who uh, we're networking with. It's, it's a strange setting in that we don't network after these events, but we would like to thank uh, Roche for their committed sponsorship to this program over the last five weeks and, and week six next week. We'd also like to thank our Marie Keating staff, our nurses and our CEO, Liz Yates, who's tuned in. And we'd also like to thank um, patients and cancer survivors who have attended our Survive and Thrive programs face to face. Um, so they know what it's like at face to face, but this is um, quite different. Our members from the Positive Living Group, so our women with metastatic breast cancer, are tuned in. And we'd like to extend a welcome um, to the wider community also. And to you, the men and women of Ireland who have been affected by cancer and understand what it is like for you and your families to live through this, and especially now. You will have received an agenda. And as I said, we've been through most of this already. So uh, these are our panelists. So you saw, you met with Avian Bannon on, for, on the first week, Dr. Laurie McDermott from Exwell Medical on the second week, uh, Breach Leddy, who is a clinical physiologist and taught us about sleep, sleeping well. And we also heard from Dr. Eddie Murphy last week on managing stress and looking after your mental health. So today I would like to introduce you to Professor Michaela Higgins. Um, and Professor, Professor Michaela Higgins is a consultant medical oncologist at the Matter Hospital. She was appointed as a UCD clinical professor in 2015 and graduated from UCD Medical School after completing three years of fellowship in medical oncology in John Hopkins Hospital, Baltimore. Um, Michaela was then appointed as an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School um, and an attending physician at Massachusetts General Hospital Boston from 2010 to 2014. Michaela also has numerous national and international clinical trials for patients with cancer and has been awarded multiple competitive grants and has published widely in the field. So very heavily involved in education and training. Um, and particularly of young doctors. Um, and in 2019, Michaela was appointed as clinical director of the Cancer Directorate at the Matter Hospital. And just to say, Michaela's at work today, so she's in the Matter Hospital, um, and we really thank her for her time. Um, and it may be, it's a busy department, there may be some people coming and going, so we will be very much aware of that and accept that. So Michaela, um, I know you were, you were going to be at an international conference, and we're yeah. delighted to have you here. I'm very privileged to have you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And thank you for your lovely messages to healthcare workers. Um, this has been quite a historic time, but it's also been a really special time uh, to be a doctor. And it's been a really lovely time in, in strange ways. And I'm very grateful and fortunate to have the job I have. And I enjoy lots of it, even in the midst of a COVID pandemic. Great. And welcome to everybody there. Thank you for your welcome. And yes, this is easier than being in Chicago. There's certainly no jet lag. I have a few slides that I'm happy to share with you, and I should say that I've tried to keep them fairly general. Obviously, I can speak in greater detail about how we're doing things here in the Matter Hospital, 
And I would say there's probably some generalities about how you can expect care to be being delivered across the country, but there might be small variations. So you'll forgive me if some of what I describe mightn't be exactly how it's going to work in your particular clinic or hospital. So I understand we're going to try and share slides now. Yeah. Um, great, that's fantastic. You can just go on to my first one. After that, you can move forward. So we can, I think the take home message I would suggest is that a lot of cancer care is still continuing. None of us think that cancer care can wait. And we have all moved very rapidly in some cases overnight to continue to deliver cancer care and not only to deliver it, but also to do everything we can to keep our particular patients safe during a time of COVID. So happily in our hospital, as I believe in many other hospitals, the vast majority of oncology care is going ahead. We might look a little bit different as we go about our business. So if we wear, how we space ourselves, and in some cases, the areas in which we deliver care have changed. And I would say be patient with us because we are learning. We all uh, are on a very steep learning curve about this virus, but also how it's going to impact our care and how we need to distance ourselves and, and space others. So every hospital system in the world is grappling with that. And I think actually, We've done tremendously well at very quickly doing what we do now, but it may change again yet in a few months. Um, at the moment, we are still giving systemic chemotherapy, tablet chemotherapy, immunotherapy, targeted treatments. We're still giving them to everybody, although perhaps monitoring them in a slightly different way. In our own hospital, and in many other hospitals, we have tried to segregate the patients as much as possible. If we know someone is COVID positive, or if we have a concern that someone could be COVID positive, they are managed in completely separate areas. So that's true of accident emergency, it's true of the radiology department, and it's certainly true of our inpatient units. So wherever possible, the two groups of patients are split, and the idea is that staff, patients, and their visitors interact as little as possible, or wherever possible, they don't interact at all. That's certainly the goal. Um, and we're not doing this alone. So also to reassure you, I represent the matter in cabin hospitals on, on weekly, at least weekly calls with the National Cancer Control Programme. And that's where representatives from each of the hospital, of the country's eight cancer centres get together regularly to discuss how are we doing? What have we learned? What could we do better? How are you managing your day? Have you gotten enough masks? Whatever the issue may be, we are meeting in some cases weekly. Personally, I'm on three calls a week with the National Cancer Control Programme. And again, I think that's a very reassuring thing that this is not just an individual doctor or an individual hospital deciding how best to coordinate care for cancer patients. There is a national effort and a very concerted, coordinated effort going on to draw up guidelines and to help us all to um, coordinate our response to this pandemic. So that group meets and includes surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncology, and we're all meeting and following up very rapidly, um, which reflects how quickly things are changing and what the priorities are from week to week. And there's no doubt that what we have done so far, and when I say we, I mean we as a nation, we have saved lives by following the guidelines, by keeping our distance and cocooning where appropriate, it has worked. Our healthcare system has not been overwhelmed. We have not gone down the same road as we saw in Italy. And thankfully that has enabled us to continue our work, for example, with our cancer patients. Just to say that if you have active cancer, or if you're receiving anti-cancer treatment at the moment, you should cocoon. So I know there is some opening up available and guidelines for the general population have changed a little bit with regards to the distance they can go and, and meeting others. But for someone in an at-risk category, which would include someone with active cancer or receiving anti-cancer treatment, the best way to stay safe and away from COVID-19 is to continue to cocoon. If you're in doubt, ask your team. Okay, we can move on to the next slide there. Just a little bit about how we look, because that also has changed. Um, in our hospital, 
we're wearing regular surgical face masks in all clinical areas. So that's when I meet someone in clinic, when they're in the day ward or whether they're on the inpatient unit, we will be wearing a regular face mask. Then we'll have a disposable, uh, just a plastic gown over our outfit or our scrubs and gloves on occasion as well if we're touching a patient. Um, for patients who have COVID or we think might have COVID-19, that's the full personal protective equipment that you might have seen in the news. So that depends on what your supply is. Sometimes it looks like a hazmat suit like you've seen in movies, which is a, a big white suit with arms and legs and sometimes a hood. Um, but more commonly, they are blue or greenish type gowns, they're called. So it's like a smock you'd have put on a child to stop them from getting paint or dinner all over them. So they sort of cover your chest and arms with gloves. And in those cases, we also use goggles or a visor. So for a patient who might have COVID, is COVID positive, there's quite a lot of regalia that goes on. Um, but the rest of the time, it's just a disposable um, plastic apron and a surgical mask. But I am aware it limits, unfortunately, a little bit of that um, body language, you know, the reassuring smile, picking up someone's sense of humor. I personally very much miss being able to have that interaction with our patient. You do lose of it by having to wear a mask. Um, you can go on the next slide there. So I wanted to say a little bit about what we're doing at the moment. And some of you um, may, of course, have experienced this already. But just for those that haven't, some ground rules that most of us are seeing to at the moment. Wherever possible, come alone for treatment. For obvious reasons, the less people that come into the hospital, the less people who can potentially pick up or share COVID-19. So for in general, please come alone for your treatment or to clinic. For our inpatient units where people are staying overnight to require care, again, the standard rule is that no visitors are allowed. We are human, you're human too, and we are absolutely making exceptions. So the obvious ones are where someone is reaching the end of life. If we have a young person or a vulnerable person who needs particular support, we are allowing visitors. And I would expect that there are, you know, flexibilities around the edges of the rules in nearly every hospital. But in general, well visits to well patients, no, we're asking you to stay at home. Um, there are no coffee shops or restaurants open in the hospitals. If you are due to attend the hospital, you'll be called a day or two in advance and you'll be asked if you have a cough, shortness of breath or a fever, any respiratory symptoms. These are symptoms that could relate to COVID. And if you have some of those symptoms, you'll be asked to call your GP and be screened for COVID before coming to the hospital. As long as you don't have those symptoms, you'll be asked to come ahead to your appointment, be it clinic or to the day ward for treatment. And when you arrive, you'll have your temperature checked by someone who'll be wearing the full regalia, the mask, the gown, probably gloves. They'll check your temperature. They may ask you those little questions again about whether or not you have a shortness of breath or cough. Wherever possible, you yourself, the staff around you, everyone in the day ward will be trying to keep their distance. So of course, this isn't because we don't like to, you know, support you or hold your hand, but at the moment, keeping our social distance wherever possible is very helpful. So we're trying to do that. Obviously, our capacities may be limited and there isn't always space around chairs in the day ward or at the nurse's station, but wherever possible, we're trying to keep your distance, our distance, and we would ask you to do the same. In some areas, ourselves included, we've moved our day ward to another area to try and reduce footfall or maybe cross traffic between two sets of patients. So as I mentioned in the beginning, we're trying to keep the non-COVID hospital areas completely separate to the COVID areas. And in some cases, that means that your day ward has changed. If you have an infection, an active infection, fevers, or um, it could be a cellulitis, which is an infection of your skin, it could be a chest infection, whatever it is, in general, we don't give a chemotherapy when someone has an active infection. That's, that's true all of the time. And in particular, if you have COVID or have had COVID, your chemotherapy will be postponed and will have to be discussed with your consultant. It is safe to give chemotherapy and immunotherapy after someone has had COVID, but in general, we would expect them to have to wait about three weeks from complete resolution of all the symptoms before we would have them come back into a day ward again to receive treatment. 
And that again is to keep them safe, to avoid the COVID infection from getting worse, but also to minimize the risk of them spreading it to someone else in the day ward. So in general, it is wait for the COVID to clear and about three weeks to make from the end of symptoms. Again, there are, these are sort of general rules, but your doctors can talk in more detail about that. This is a picture of what many of our outpatient clinics have traditionally looked like in Ireland. Lots of queuing people in a waiting room, standing, waiting, sitting close together for up to several hours. I'm afraid, and maybe it's long overdue, those days are gone. We simply, at this time, cannot foresee going back to clinic rooms full of people in close rubbing shoulder distance to each other. So if you go on to the next slide there, here are some of the considerations we'll have to work on to make sure that those clinics like that again. Realistically, if we are to see the same number of patients, but to socially distance them out, we're gonna need longer working days, which requires more staff, or else the same number of staff, but a larger area. And remember, every clinic in my hospital is going to need this, and we simply will not have more space for everybody every day to see patients in a socially distanced manner. So again, patients will be required. We're, we're making efforts and changing everything we can rapidly to get the clinics back up and running as near to normal as possible, but it is going to take time. Um, at the moment, we have to give priority for those who come in person to those who really need to be physically seen. And in general, most of us are prioritizing patients who, for whatever reason, really need a physical examination. And I think new patients who are just learning their cancer diagnosis probably need that first consultation still to be in person. On the other hand, I think we are learning that many other patients can safely be seen less frequently particularly if you've had recent imaging, for example, a CAT scan or a mammogram, if it's been a normal study or, or shows something stable, that lends itself well to you having a phone call to be given those results and the follow-up plan being made. And I think some of my patients are finding that it's great. They don't have to get involved with parking. They save money. It's less hassle. They understand the plan. So from the foreseeable future going forward, if you can have what we call a virtual visit, which means you not coming here and having your team touch face with you by phone or video, we'll be doing that as much as possible. And yes, of course, anyone who has a concern or a symptom that you're worried about, please talk to us about it and um, we'll see you if it needs be in the hospital. For many times, um, patients, for example, breast cancer patients on follow-up often get routine appointments with a lot of different teams. You may have an appointment with the surgeon, the medical oncologist, and the radiation oncologist. I think we need to be really thoughtful about that and space out the visits. In reality, you may not actually need to be seen with everybody if you're well, if it's just for surveillance. Obviously, if you have a symptom, you should be seen by the right person. We are trying out a lot of different safe technologies, be it phone or video that can link with our hospital system and that leave a safe record of the visit. Um, there isn't yet a national solution. So ourselves, the National Cancer Programme and hospitals throughout the country are working on that. And I hope there will be sort of a universal solution, but there isn't one yet. So again, that's, we're gonna have to watch this space. All right, we can go on to the next slide there. These are just a few things I put together. If you know that you're going to be having a call or a video conference with your doctor or a member of your team, at a particular time, here's just a few things to consider. If you're not comfortable with the phone, with the technology, or if there's any reason why you feel you can't comfortably speak freely or at a time um, that they've suggested, let us know. We're all flexible and, and want to work with you to find a time or a mechanism that suits. So don't be afraid to say, that doesn't suit me, or I'll have someone here, I won't be able to speak on the phone. Just let us know. Um, it's really helpful if you always have a list of your medications with you and if you jot down your questions in advance. We all know that you can have all of these thoughts in your head and that the minute you go into clinic, they go out the window and you forget what you were going to say. It happens to all of us and the way to prevent it is to try and keep a list with you, particularly since you won't be able to have a family member come in with you to the in-person visit. So when you're at home, um, write down anything you think of over the days before your appointment and have your medication study. 
we really want to hear about any sims you're concerned about. So again, if you notice a twinge in your toe or a tickle in your thumb, write it down because again, you might forget it when you're on the phone at the time. And so if you've noticed, have a think about it and jot down on paper the things you want to raise while you're there. If you like, you can certainly put the call on speakerphone and have a family member listen in so that you've got a second pair of ears. And don't forget, hopefully your team won't, but the last part of the encounter should be, should include a discussion with you about what the next steps are. When do you expect to come back to clinic? Are you due to have a scan? Who will you hear from next, etc. So whatever, towards the end of whatever appointment you're having, you should know the next step, what's going to happen afterwards. Um, and those things are mainly true of an in-person visit as well, but I think particularly important while we're doing things virtually. I wrote a little bit on the next slide about some of the considerations for the, for, for the future. And I have to acknowledge that just a few months ago, we had absolutely no idea that our medical and personal lives would be utterly changed by a global pandemic. And I really don't know how things are going to look in another six months time. So again, we've worked very quickly. We've made a lot of rapid decisions. I think the HSE has been very innovative and flexible. And it's worked really well in a lot of areas, but no, it's not perfect. And when you move quickly and have to make rapid decisions, it, you're rarely going to get things right absolutely first time. So we're doing our best. Unfortunately, it looks like COVID is here for the foreseeable future. So we're going to have to work with it. We may never or only very slowly get back what we knew as normal. But I would be very confident. I think we've learned that we can be flexible and rise to this challenge. So we'll continue to learn and I'm sure we'll evolve and continue to deliver care as best we can. A little note about your carers. Everyone here also has families. They have children. They've got stuff going at home, on at home too. We're struggling with homeschooling. We're doing our best to keep you safe, but also themselves safe. So when you come to the hospital, there is no doubt you are our priority. But if you find that things perhaps aren't working in as streamlined and as smooth a fashion as possible, I would ask that you bear with us. This has been a really challenging time. And I feel I speak for 99.99999% of my colleagues when I say that we are doing our best and our priority is to continue to give you as good a care as absolutely possible. All right, um, back to you there, Helen. I'm happy to consider a few questions. Um, okay. That's brilliant, Michaela. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, that's very clear and concise. And I think for those who are listening in the audience, um, it gives people a really good insight into how it is if they haven't been in hospital already um, and what to expect. I know like there is an unknown, but um, to know, um, you know, how, how things are at the moment is very reassuring, I think, for a lot of people. Um, and, good. you know, I, 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 I do feel in the beginning, I suppose most people who, you know, including everybody ourselves, um, thought that if you caught COVID or contracted COVID, it was almost, you know, end game. But I think we've learned that that's not the case now. So people are much more reassured. I know myself in the positive living group that we run for women with metastatic breast cancer, they've actually shared their experiences and their experiences have been very positive and very, um, you know, very secure and, re and they've reassured other people as they've, as they've gone. So that's really nice to know. Um, so now I'm just going to unshare the screen for a minute and, and we'll see what kind of questions we've got coming in, Michaela. Okay. So let me see now. Okay. So the first question we have here is um, from an anonymous attendee. Let me just move this over. So how do I deal with the anxiety of finding a breast lump during COVID-19 and having an appointment cancelled by a symptomatic breast clinic? So the symptomatic breast cancer, breast services have had to um, curtail their services and that will be a challenge and playing catch up with that truthfully will be a challenge not just now but for the for many months what has been done is that um the referrals sent in by the gps have been so first of all that person should absolutely go to their gp 
and where appropriate the GP should examine them and should send that referral into the um, same triple assessment clinics as they always did. So those referral pathways are absolutely still open and up and running. Um, when those referrals are received, they are triaged by a consultant. So a consultant goes through them and as far as possible tries to um, divide them into priority areas and those that get the highest priority, those that are thought to be most, most likely to represent a cancer are still brought in. Because we're having to space patients out and clean all the machines in between each woman, it, only small numbers can be seen in that fashion. So hopefully, if the person hasn't got an appointment, it's because the clinical factors that go with the rest of that referral have not raised um, the concern levels enough for them to get an urgent appointment. Um, they can certainly go back to their GP if they think there is a, a change in the breast lump. And the GP can always lift up a phone to the symptomatic breast clinic. That's the other thing that sometimes helps if they particularly feel it's an urgent referral and hopefully then the woman would be seen. Also, those clinics are picking up a little bit. Um, we were getting through very small numbers per week, um, but those are rising steadily week on week. But there's no doubt I have to acknowledge there will be a, a, a long period of catch up. But the, they, are being, they are being triaged by consultants on the basis of urgency and likelihood of it being cancer. Okay, thank you, Michaela. And then just moving on from that, actually, the, there's a question, um, I suppose, as an uh, adjunct to that. So how do you think the hospitals will cope with the anticipated increased demand um, for services? So you, you mentioned that in your talk that you would require bigger, you know, bigger rooms and more staff. Um, yeah, those... it's, it's a huge challenge. It's a massive challenge. And, and I alone, my hospital alone, the HSE doesn't have all the answers to that. There has been an injection of funding into the hospitals to help cope with COVID. And we are hoping there will be a similar, if not bigger injection to cope with the fallout of, of post COVID um, and to help us to hire staff to um, make the infrastructural, even building changes that we'll need to do to be able to use our clinics and to space our patients and to look at longer working days, which many of us anticipate we'll just have to do. Mm. So I, we can do it, but it's gonna require staff and funding. And it will be up to bosses way above me to figure out when and how we get that extra support. So we're certainly doing our best and working differently and being very flexible in how we do a lot and happily cancer services for the most part have functioned very well. I appreciate there may be some delays getting into the cancer system, but once you are diagnosed with a cancer, those patients are still receiving their care. Um, but there is a massive challenge ahead for the country, not just for um, ourselves. But I, I can only say they did inject cash and we've been able to hire people now like we never were before. And nobody's able to travel. So at a very practical level, all the nurses and young doctors that we used to use to lose to the UK, to Australia, to other places, they're all at home now, so there's lots of good people available for hire. So I'm hoping we'll be able to take them up on, you know, we have a stack of CVs on my directorate nurse manager's desk, and we're hoping we can give contracts to a lot of those good people. Excellent, yeah. So there's a surge of people coming back to the country, wasn't yeah. there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, this is another anonymous question, um, Michaela. I finished treatment just before COVID outbreak. To assess risk level, what are the considerations to assess risk level? Oh, sorry. Where's that gone on me now? It's jumped. Um, I'll find it again. Yeah. So, sorry about that. What are the considerations to assess risk level? Example, it is no, it is num, is it number of weeks, months post treatment, or is it more about time since completing chemo or radiotherapy? Thanks. Um, I'm presuming she's talking about the risk of getting COVID. And I suspect, given the fact that she said surgery and radiation, this might also be a breast cancer patient, because of course, which cancer it is and the setting of treatment um, would affect my answer to that. So I suppose just to go back to basics, someone who has active cancer and who is on active anti-cancer treatment, be it chemotherapy or immunotherapy or targeted biologic treatment, we would consider all of them at high risk for A, picking up 
COVID-19 were they to come in contact with it and B, get pretty sick with it if they got it. So people on active treatment or with active cancer, for example, metastatic disease, those patients should consider to co continue to cocoon and we would consider them high risk. I, I think this person might be finished chemotherapy for now, which sounds great. And they're moving on with their um, follow-up, what we would call adjuvant treatment for what might've been an early breast cancer. And in those cases, um, every week and month that goes by, her immune system will be closer and closer to normal. And um, usually patients stay off work for another few months and then can return from a COVID point of view. I think most of us would feel your immune system probably isn't entirely normal until about 12 months out from chemotherapy. But at that time, I would be comfortable that your risk of COVID either picking up or getting sick with COVID would be about the same as the general population. So this is something myself and other colleagues have talked about with the National Comprehensive Cancer Program. And most of us feel that if you're within a year of chemotherapy, you should continue, continue to cocoon. Um, and that if you're a year out and if you're on follow-up with no evidence of cancer, that you may go about your routine business and would be considered very low risk for contracting and getting ill with COVID. That said, as we all know, there are very healthy people who get very sick with COVID. Mm -hmm. But I think about a year after chemotherapy, you're the same risk as the general population. Okay, excellent. And then there's another question here from an anonymous attendee. I'm finished treatment. I'm waiting to go in for a day, a day procedure to have my port removed. Any sense when these type of procedures will resume? Um, I think it'll be a little while yet. I have several patients in that situation myself. So as you might be able to figure out, if you have, a, we have a radiology department and there are people coming in as an emergency who need urgent scans because they are critically unwell right now. We need to check that their head isn't bleeding, that their stomach hasn't perforated. Those are urgent scans that need to be done. We have everybody who's actively on treatment and we're trying to decide should they have is the chemotherapy helping or not? So that would be the next level of less urgent than that, but still a bit urgent. And truthfully, if you are well and your port can be flushed, it is not urgent. So when it comes to prioritizing what services can be postponed, removing a port can be postponed safely. So until services get up to full speed again, that is the sort of um, procedure that will have to wait until there is capacity in the system and, and I don't know when that will be. We're slowly but surely getting there in the matter um, but it, it, won't be in, um, it, it won't be instant. The only thing I would say is you know just make sure your port is flushed every four to six weeks to keep it um, good and clean and to let your team know if there's any redness or pain or discharge from it. Okay. You ready for another one? Thank you. Sure. Um, so a question here from Liz. Are there more oral treatments being used since COVID? And if so, are these as effective as receiving intravenous treatment? Oh, um, possibly is the answer to that. Um, so there are a few, well, really only two or three um, chemotherapy agents that can be given orally. And they are absolutely as effective as intravenous. And they are also as toxic as intravenous chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. People sometimes think if I'm getting it in a tablet form, it must be mild. No, it's exactly the same. It's just a different way of giving it, but the potential for side effects is just the same. You might not need to come to hospital as often, so that's an advantage for giving it in a time of COVID if you're well able to swallow tablets, which is a challenge for some people. So for oral chemotherapies, um, Yes, some hospitals are using them to keep people out of hospital and they're just as efficacious. They work just as well. The other types of tablets that we often use are what are called um, small targeted agents. Um, so for lung cancer patients, things like erlotinib or Tarceva or for renal cancer, kidney cancer, there might be things like Sutent or Serafinib. So those are biologic agents and um, we those still, you know, a patient receiving that is still very active treatment and they'd be at about the same risk of COVID-19 as, as someone on chemotherapy. So I don't think we're using them more than usual, but in some places to reduce admission need to come to the hospital, we might be using them a little bit um, more, but I, I don't think any doctor would use them um, inappropriately. So I, the decision is still what's the best treatment for this patient. 
And I suppose if there were two equally good treatments available for a patient and one of them was going to keep her out of the hospital more, I would lean towards that one at a time of COVID. Um, so those are nuances and, and, and decisions that your, your doctor can make with you. And you can always ask your nurse or your doctor to explain the choice of medicine. But I don't think people are choosing less good treatment options. They're just up to perhaps equally good options there may be going with the one that keeps you out of the hospital or has the potential to keep you out of the hospital more. Okay. Yeah, no, that's, that's a really good question, isn't it? Mm. Um, okay, Michaela, there's one here about screening. I know you're not in screening services, but Liz is asking, would you also be concerned about the ongoing pausing of our screening services? Do you see these being reinstated in the near future? Um, so I would like all of our services to be fully operational, but I fully understand that we are in the middle of a global pandemic and it is going to affect um, the levels of care that we can provide. So difficult decisions have to be made and screening a population to find very, very, screening a well population to find very, very low numbers of patients is not without risk. The problem is if you are to screen 10,000 patients to see if they have a bowel tumor or 10,000 women to see if you can find a breast cancer, bringing all those women into a small unit and potentially exposing them and each other to COVID-19 is a far greater risk. So at this time, the screening programs actually could do harm. Bringing that number of people back into the system in itself increases the risk, unfortunately, of spreading COVID-19. And the potential for benefit is that you would pick up a small number of cancers. Compounded by that, at the moment, our resources are dedicated and prioritizing the sickest, most urgent patients. So to keep routine cancer care going, at this time, we can't safely provide a screening service in addition to getting people in with the breast lump, for example, for, for that woman to get in. We can't also be doing a screening service. So the ideal world where everybody gets screened all the time, I, I'm afraid we're just not living in that environment at the moment. And I honestly feel a screening program open fully at this time could do more harm to the people coming in for screening than the potential benefit of detecting a cancer in those asymptomatic well patients. So if you have a symptom, that's not a screening test. If you have a symptom, you need to go to your GP and you'll be referred in for a, for a rapid access clinic. So there's no, those are two different things. If you have a symptom, you go to a rapid access clinic. If you don't have a symptom and you're very well, screening is, is something that can wait and will have to. Thanks. I know it's hard for people. It, 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 you know, I, I would love to say we've every service up and running, but it's just not possible in the middle of a global pandemic and there'll be catch up after it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important, isn't it, Michaela, to, to make the distinction between screening and the well yes. population and those exactly. who have a symptom. Um, yeah. Completely agree. So screening is a completely well woman who has no symptoms whatsoever, who's going to have things like her cholesterol checked, her mammogram, and um, potentially have her stool checked for a cold blood to pick up a cancer that she had no notion that she might have. And um, to do that, you have to screen a huge number, like tens of thousands of healthy people to pick up a small number of cancers and bringing tens of thousands of people into a hospital at the moment, tens of thousands of healthy people into a hospital at the moment, I'm afraid is not a safe thing to do. Okay. Um, so I have another question here, Michaela, from uh, Catherine. She says, hello, Michaela, met you in Cavan Oncology Clinic. I'm on <laughs> hello. ongoing. What are my risks of getting COVID and what should I be doing to look after myself best? Okay. Your risks of getting COVID are low because hopefully you're continuing to cocoon really well. And if you, the, the, the COVID is a virus, it, ha it has to jump from human to human and it, it doesn't survive in isolation by itself. So if you are cocooning well, which I would strongly recommend you do, your chances of picking it up are very low. They're not zero, unfortunately. Coming into the hospital for treatment increases your risk. Perhaps you could meet someone in the car park. You could push a button on a lift. You could push a door frame and maybe someone who had COVID will have touched that. To try and minimize those risks, 
cabin, as you know, has moved to a slightly different location on the ground floor of the hospital so that your traffic is, is minimized and you go into a unit away from the rest of the hospital and your staff there aren't moving. And that's true here too. And I maybe should have mentioned when we come into work now, you stay in the one place for the entirety of your shift and you don't go for coffee. You don't mingle with your mates. You don't get to go down on the corridor, but we're doing all of that. So we ourselves aren't pushing buttons, spreading elevators, doing anything possible and hand washing and social distancing as much as possible. So you cocooning yourself minimizes those risks and the hospital is mitigating your risks by having the staff stay put, wear their uniforms, use their appropriate um, hand washing etiquette and where possible even move your location altogether. So using all of those things, your risks are very low. And I can only speak to our personal experience in the matter, but since the middle of March, we have continued to treat between 40 and 50 patients per day, Monday to Friday in our day ward. And touching wood, I'm happy to say that not one patient coming in for chemotherapy has developed COVID-19. So I think that's a testament to hopefully some of the efforts we're doing to keep our unit very clean. And I know staff across the country are doing that and also how very well our patients are cocooning. I think that is really key. Um, you have to pick it up somewhere from someone. So minding yourself as home is, is, is cocooning is the answer and keeping social distance wherever possible. That's how to do it. Yeah, I think, I think you're right, Michaela. And, and I think cancer patients do it really well. They do. They've been doing it, yeah. They've been doing it. They've been isolating themselves during treatment before COVID even, you know. Yeah. That degree. And, and can I just second actually what you said earlier, happily touch wood, the number of patients we in the matter have had with active cancer and a COVID infection has been extremely low. Um, and those that we have had have done remarkably well. Now I know it's not perfect and it's not a huge number of patients and maybe everyone will be different. That's why we're being so cautious. But for what few patients I've had who've been COVID positive, they've done remarkably well. Um, so please God um, remember all statistics are statistics, but human beings are, are very variable and we all are very unique and behave differently. So don't read too much onto the online stuff and what's out there. You even, we're doing everything possible to prevent you from getting COVID-19, but even if you do, for the vast majority of people, even cancer patients, it's a mild infection that passes. Yeah, and I think like there's always that the worry, like there's another question there, and I think we might we close off after that, Michaela, thank you so much. But I, there's a worry about people, what they, what they should be wearing. So there's a question here, it's anonymous as well. Can I wear my own homemade mask instead of surgical one when attending an appointment? There is quite, they, they are quite dear to buy and only can be used for short time. So if delayed, would be using a couple on a visit, especially in hot weather. Oh, you don't have to buy your own mask at all. Um, so if, you, if the hospital requires you to wear a mask, they'll give it to you you don't have to supply your own mask. I know there are some people coming in with their own masks. Um, and actually, one you get freshly here in the hospital is cleaner. Um, so I would far rather that you use the one that the HSE provide, but absolutely not. I don't, you don't need to buy it. Um, that's an unnecessary cost for a patient that I wouldn't ask anyone. I, I heard your man, Michael O'Leary, saying that Ryanair um, Passengers have to buy their own surgical masks when they fly, but I would not expect that of any cancer patient. If you are required to wear a mask, we'll give it to you. You don't have to buy it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Michaela. I'm sure that's very reassuring. And I think everything that you've said um, today, Michaela, has been extraordinarily reassuring for people. And you're living in it. Oh, you're, you know, you're in a hospital. You know what it's like. And I suppose for those who haven't entered a hospital, or you know, or uh, they have pending appointments. It's very reassuring to know that they are probably as safe as they could ever be. I agree. Yes. So um, on that note, Michaela, thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm going to share the screen again just to say say a few more words. Um, but we have been delighted to have you, and it's been our privilege. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. So there's some useful websites um, and we have information on our cancer and COVID um, and uh, Michaela's uh, video will be up there later on today or tomorrow maybe. Um, and also we also um, 
talk about the HSE website, gov.ie um, and the HSE and in particular the National Cancer Control Programme where most of our information comes from on um, patients with cancer and COVID. Um, so we've had our Q&A time. So I would like to thank you all very much for submitting questions. It makes the webinar more real for everybody. Um, and I'm sure the questions that you might want to ask, somebody else may have asked. So it's, it's an education in itself. So thank you very much for that. Um, and just to say, I suppose, before we go, that we are continuing to run supportive cancer services for our survivors. Um, we're looking at work, um, managing a six-week program on Survive and Thrive workshops uh, in webinar form. Um, a little bit more um, difficult, I suppose, in, in that sense, because they're literally workshops where people learn from each other and, and are empowered. We do continue to, to run our positive living programs and support groups. Um, for women with metastatic breast cancer. They are open um, to any, any individuals who have, um, ha, who have metastatic cancers and are on ongoing treatment. And this is a group that feel very vulnerable. And I think um, the webinars have been um, a very positive experience for them because they are actually seeing each other. They're linking in with, with each other and they're actually creating positivity in some way um, for each other too. So they're, they're living COVID as best they can. Um, we are, we're, as you know, we're on week five of our webinar um, and next week we'll be talking about managing side effects. Um, and we also have a bracket peer-to-peer -peer support volunteer uh, group for those who may be susceptible um, um, to a positive BRCA gene um, um, and therefore at risk of uh, further cancer. So um, our website is there. Um, we also have a surviveandthrive.ie website. So that's always worth a visit um, in these times and, and any time actually. Um, and I'd also like to share with you, you know, we talked a lot and we have heard a lot about, I suppose, um, people in the community now who have symptoms. Um, and we have corporate wellness webinars managed and run by our senior oncology nurse, Bernie Carter. And they're beginning to take off now and it's really encouraging um, and motivational for us in that people are now beginning to want to learn more about different types of cancers um, and to know what they should do if they find something abnormal. Um, and we are available and we are educating people on knowing the signs and symptoms of specific types of cancers, what you should do, um, and this is where you can go. So that's our phone line there man managed by Angela. Um, and our um, email if you want any further information on those webinars. Um, this weekend, of course, would have been Bloom weekend and we've spent many years in Bloom and we have always had a ribbon wall there. And this has been a very special um, tribute um, for everybody really in the Marie Keating Foundation and for those who've actually um, you know, made a tribute to someone they loved maybe somebody who has been diagnosed with cancer, someone they've lost to cancer, um, or just remembering somebody. Um, and now we have the addition of maybe those who may have lost somebody to, cancer, to, to COVID um, during a cancer journey. So we have a ribbon wall um, and you can pin a ribbon for somebody you'd like to remember. So um, I think that's a lovely thing to do. Um, and certainly in reality at Bloom, it, it was actually a very, um, I suppose it was a very emotional thing for people to do and to remember. So that is there virtually, if anybody would like to, to visit that, um, the wall of love. Um, and as I always say before signing off, um, do sign up for a newsletter and keep up to date with campaigns and services that we're running. Um, connect to our final um, webinar next week if you can. Um, that's with Mary Moriarty, um, Managing Side Effects. And if you'd like to hold a virtual coffee morning for us, we would be delighted. Um, as, as we know, um, charities are going through a very difficult time at the moment um, and everything counts. So um, I'm going to leave you now. Um, I hope to see a lot of you again next week. We're in this together, so hopefully we'll stay connected um, and we'll make it through together. Um, so here is uh, our next week's webinar managing side effects of treatment. I know some people have asked specifically to talk about pain control and we will do that. And we'll also talk about managing fatigue, which is very often becomes a very chronic um, side effect 
from cancer and its treatment and needs to be managed well. So that's from 7 to 8 p.m. on the 10th of June. Thank you very much for listening.